today we'll be taking notes over modernist literature. Um, so get your C notes out, pause it if you need to, and here we go. The time period for modernist literature is approximately 1890 to 1950. This is a very important time because 1890, you know, we're, we're ending the 1800s, the turn of the century. We have the invention of the automobile. We have World War I, uh, World War II, the Depression. Um, and some people think, you know, all of these wars and all of these innovations happening so quickly led to a huge change in literature. Um, Virginia Woolf, one of the modernist authors I'm going to talk about in this set of notes, she said that it happened on or about December 10th, 1910, that the human race completely changed due to all of the stress of all this innovation. Now, some poets did start before 1890 um, as post-romantic poets. Uh, William B. Yeats was one of those. We may or may not study him this year. And so they're still considered modernist poets, even though they were writing before 1890. Some poets continued writing after World War II. Um, e. E. Cummings, T. S. Eliot, they're still they were still writing after World War II, after 1950, but again are still considered major players in the modernist movement. The focus was in Europe and North America. This is a British lit class, generally, and so you know, we're gonna focus in those areas. Some major characteristics of the modernist style. Um, there's a purposeful shift away from traditional styles. It makes sense that the literature would reflect the technology and the changes in industrialization and the changes in the way people thought about life and death. You have the invention of bombs, the invention of the H-bomb. You know, this is a huge deal that's really changing the way people think about how they live their daily lives. It also includes techniques such as stream of consciousness, where the character is just talking. They're just saying everything that's in their head, and it's sort of disorganized and really reflects the way that we think. There's also the interior monologue, where it's, um, you know, we have first-person narratives before this time period. However, the interior monologue of the modernist era focuses more on um, the feelings of sort of the common man, not as much the you know, the bourgeois rich people. There's also writing in multiple points of view. If you're with me sophomore year, we read the Poisonwood Bible, which is told from the point of view, you know, of five different people. So that's got really started during the modernist time period. And this modern literature reflected the need for greater um, psychological realism, especially during the world wars. Literature is how people cope with life. And so, um, this modernist literature reflected this anxiety inside of the common man um, as we sort of had no control over the world wars and over the decisions that the government was making. Um, T.S. Eliot said that modernist literature is a way of controlling, of ordering, of giving a shape and a significance to the immense panorama of futility and anarchy, which is contemporary history. Instead of narrative method, we may now use the mythical method. It is, I seriously believe, a step toward making the modern world possible for art. Okay, so what does that even mean? What it means is, um, this literature of the modernist period gives order to this ever-changing world at the start of the 20th century, helps us cope with the invention of the automobile. Um, in The Great Gatsby, where, um, you know, I guess Myrtle, it's been a long time, someone's killed in a car accident. That never happened before 1904. Never in the history of the world had anyone ever been killed in a car accident before 1904. And, just, and it's really not that long ago. It acknowledges that the world politics are not working. The futility and anarchy, Eliot says, that, um, you know, we have no hope, kind of, of getting ourselves out of this mess we've gotten ourselves into with the world wars, the crash of the stock market, the Great Depression. Um, all of these things are really hurting us, and the politics are not working. It also criticizes the ubiquity of Western culture and acknowledges its decay and fragmentation 
as anarchy and war changed the world at that time. Um, when I say the ubiquity of Western culture, ubiquity means um, universalness. Uh, and so Western culture had become, um, to the West, the way the world works. You know, they weren't thinking about third world countries. They were thinking about, well, this is how we do it, so this is how everyone has to do it. With t you know, TVs later on, motor cars, um, wealth, and credit, and just uh, the materialism of the Western culture and the decay and fragmentation that it brought to the soul of mankind, this materialism. Um, as people fought against political power uh, in Russia and elsewhere. And then, um, you know, it, Elliot, in the pre this previous slide here, says that it make, they're making the modern world possible for art. In order to cope with the modern world, they had to change the way art addressed the needs of the people. Um, some major characteristics that you'll see in modernist literature, they often will use words as parts of speech that they aren't, such as nouns are used as adjectives, verbs as nouns, etc. Um, when we study E.E. E. Cummings, you'll see that really heavily. Now, Shakespeare did that in his writing, but um, the English language had really been standardized since that time in the 1600s, um, late 1500s, and so um, there had been less innovation with the language itself. But modernist poets wanted to change that. They reworked traditional forms. They used the sonnet. We looked at Design by Robert Frost, where he changed the traditional form of the sonnet into something completely different. They used disjointed structure to reflect the dysfunction of Western society. Um, one of my favorite poems, The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot, is a modernist work. and the whole poem seems to have no central theme or no central image that it's focusing on, um, but the focus is the disjointed structure and the dysfunction and crumbling of Western society. Um, and also, this literature is meant to address the inner thoughts of regular people. It's less about the wealthy, about the upper class, and more about the, the regular common man. Um, at this time, some major players in the artistic world were Pablo Picasso, Picasso, Henri Matisse, and other Cubists. They embraced minimalism. Um, during this time, we are discovering Native American art, um, Mayan, South American art, African art for the first time in the Western culture. And so, some artists are intrigued by the minimalist, the low use of color or the low use of um, lots and lots of images, and they are just settling or using fewer angles and um, fewer blends. They're focusing more on minimalism, and they're celebrating the power of simplicity, again, as a um, critique of the materialism and the greed of Western culture. Um, as far as authors, I've got cut off down here, but um, Virginia Woolf, is her picture over here, Joseph Conrad, William Faulkner, um, they explored the inner mind of man. And um, you can't really see that there, but they separated from the idea that the authors were only supposed to write about the wealthy. So it says at the bottom there, wealthy. Um, that authors and artists were only for the rich. No. Authors and artists are for the common man. Okay. As for poets, um, the major players, and so we're going to study and have studied some of these. Um, Ezra Pound, E.E. E. Cummings, T.S. Eliot, H.D., uh, abbreviated her name, Hilda Doolittle, who that is, Robert Frost, and many, many more. They're critics of Western culture. They used words and traditional forms in new ways, and we've already seen that with design, the spider flower moth poem by Robert Frost, um, and I have pictured for you here um, this poem called Buffalo Bills by E.E. E. Cummings, and you can see the way um, he structured it is different than the sonnet, where you would have a box, a block of text, um, and look here, one, two, three, four, five pigeons just like that, he mushes the words together, okay, um, 
blue-eyed. He doesn't capitalize the letter I. Um, and he makes that for it's water smooth. Like, what, what is that? So, um, poets are really being innovative at this time and changing up the way things are done. And this is just one example here of E.E. E. Cummings' work. And I love him. I think he's really great. And we're going to look at some of his poems this week. All right. Hope you enjoyed your presentation. My presentation.